Good evening. Welcome to Diversity TV Season Three. I'm Mark Harris, and I'll be introducing our guests shortly. Um, tonight we'll be uh, we're doing kind of a twofer because one of the things that we often look at, uh, uh, e even though in in past seasons uh, youth and the GLBTQ TS uh, perspective have been si considered separately. Tonight we're combining them. And uh, go to slide, if you will, just so I can explain the acronym. Uh, youth, you already know what that is. GLBTQTS is gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgendered, uh, queer questioning, two spirit perspective. Uh, if you're just tuning in for the first time, Diversa TV's mission is to illuminate everyday diversity issues and give the mic and the camera to those who don't always get it. Uh, our season so far, uh, we usually always start out, because we're on Turtle Island, we always start out with a native perspective. Um, <clears throat> and then we go to Anglo. Uh, African Americans in Eugene, uh, February Latino, uh, Longhouse Update on the 13th, uh, Pan-Asian Perspective, uh, and last week uh, for the first time we had one of the, a member from the Eugene uh, Black Pioneer family, so-called, and we had a, a great show with call-ins from his relatives. Um, now we have a youth uh, GL tonight show, youth GLBTQTS, and uh, next week we'll be looking at class and winding out the season spirituality and religion, and then we'll be starting up again in the second week of April. Tonight, uh, Nathan Brockett, uh, who is president of the South Eugene High School GSA Gay Straight Alliance. Welcome, Nathan. I'm glad to be here. And he's also a Youth Action Board member. So let's start out. Uh, where are you from? Well, I'm a homegrown Eugenian. Actually, I was born at home here. I uh, have lived my whole life here. Of course, I've moved through several houses, so I've experienced Eugene from many angles. OK. Yeah. So um, all your life, uh, what, is, what do GSA and the Youth Action Board do? Well, now, um, I suppose the commonality between these things would be their focus on youth and the power of youth to create change in the community. Um, I'll start with the Gay Straight Alliance because I'm more intimately entwined with that organization having essentially revitalized it at South Eugene High School. Mm. So I had, you know, I go to South, of course, quite regularly and face all that comes along with that every day. One of the things I was becoming increasingly aware of was the fact that the social atmosphere was entirely inappropriate towards, you know, GLBTQ youth. So I decided that there really needed to be a much stronger gay-straight alliance presence in the school to encourage acceptance and diversity amongst all the youth. So I immediately set out on the struggle and it was somewhat epic considering I had to, you know, battle the administration and everyone else involved in order to get the recognition and support that I needed to succeed. Battle the administration because, I mean, as you say, I mean, it was revived, so it's not like you had to start from scratch. But. Not entirely. Hmm. However, uh, the one that was previ previously existing was given no administrative support whatsoever. Okay. However, other minority groups such as um, you know black student union BSA and Latino student union and uh, Asian student union which are all organizations itself have been supported by the administration and encouraged to flourish whereas the gay straight alliance has always and consistently been swept under the rug if you will so my first battle was to get recognition that this is an issue youth um, at South Eugene High School and in general are facing and it's an issue that the administration needs interest in solving. So I set it underway. Um, well, the first thing I had to do was uh, reshift the focus of the previously existing Gay Straight Alliance. Mm. In the previous Gay Straight Alliance, there were four members. Mm. There was myself, the president, 
a random friend of mine and a random friend of his. <laughs> now, you can understand, of course, in that situation that really we weren't getting much done. So the first thing I had to do was um, convert that situation into a situation in which I would have more leadership capabilities so that I could direct it in a way that I thought would be more appropriate for everyone. How so? Well, one of the main things we needed was to, as a group, come out of the closet and become involved actively in the community at school. And that wasn't happening. And, you know, people really stressed the idea that this would be a situation um, where everyone's perspective would be respected and where it would be entirely confidential. And that is an important space for people to have. But I felt as if the role of a gay-straight alliance should be a space of open communication where change and social justice can be addressed and where anyone is free to voice um, their opinions and feel in the social atmosphere the repercussions of those opinions. And that is what I wanted to see. Feel the repercussions or be free of repercussions? Well now, to be free of repercussions would be to live in a situation where your words stop short of the room. To feel the repercussions would be to experience them resounding through the lips of your peers as they resonate through the hallways and classrooms of ah, school. Good distinction. Okay. So I felt like there needed to be addressing this, you know, more addressing the situation. And well, I've noticed that at South Eugene High School, and undoubtedly, you know, it's indicative of several other communities in the nation and perhaps internationally, the homosexual issue has incessantly been hidden. You know, it's been an, a non-issue. And I think the main reason for this is that um, when faced with adversity, when faced with discrimination, as, homo as a homosexual, we have the ability to hide, to disappear when it's uncomfortable to identify as who we are. Mm -hmm. and, and, well, uncomfortable for who? Well, uncomfortable for whoever's being made uncomfortable. Okay. See, okay. take this hypothetically. I go into a room and I hear people making, you know, queer jokes and stuff right. that are quite derogatory. Right. See, now I'm, now I'm faced with a choice. Either I openly become the target of that derogatory conversation or I hide and not have to deal with it and not have to worry about it and not have to be afraid and make it a non-issue. Now, this is very common. This occurs more often than any of us know. If everyone was open and willing and able to address situations, you would, there, you would see a lot more gay people than you see, you know? And there would be a lot less discrimination than there is simply because we, as a hidden minority, have the ability to disguise ourselves when it's more comfortable mm -hmm. to do so. Mm -hmm. This was happening at South Eugene High School. And it's happening everywhere, I'm sure, but I go to South, so I had to start with where I was. At South Eugene High School, I noticed as a quote-unquote progressive place, um, theoretically, and only theoretically, <laughs> everybody was... There's a certain reality that you're speaking well, of that... Uh, there's, yeah. of course, the stratification between what the mind does and what, what um, it inspires action to Indeed, do. Indeed, right. And... At South Eugene High School. Stratification is a good way of putting yes. it, yes. At South Eugene High School, there was a great amount of theoretical acceptance. Mm. Now, since this inherent nature to homosexuality allows uncomfortable individuals to disguise themselves as other than what they are, in other words, to be inauthentic at the expense of everyone else who is being authentic, because of this, um, this quote unquote theoretical acceptance had not been thoroughly tested. And one of my goals was to get more than theoretical acceptance, you know, more than hypothetical tolerance. I want people to understand and embrace and celebrate a minority that is, quite frankly, being not only underrepresented but discriminated against in almost all situations in this culture and most other cultures. One of the things that um mostly straight people question about, um, I mean, the term is used, and I've actually used it sometimes, sexual minorities. Mm. 
because we, we, we someday have to really test that because, I mean, our data about that is like Kinsey. So as fickle as the people you test. Yeah, right. You know, so 10%, whatever, you know. Who knows? Who knows, for real. But even at 10%, significant numbers, sufficient numbers, right? Quite a large minority as far yeah. as minorities. Yeah, right. So um, when you mention, for example, the other student clubs, of eth and you specifically reference ethnic minorities, mm -hmm. right, who, you know, unless they're so-called mixed race, right, yeah. uh, and the genetic phenotypical characteristics, you know, can be ambiguous, well, you look like something, but... Well, we and don't therefore, the social pressure is to belong to that something. Right. Yeah. Um, and those people, you know, because Eugene has had a, such a, shall we say, checkered racial past, yeah. it's easy to say, oh, well, you know, those minorities are subject to attack, even in a place as progressive as sexual, uh, as, as South Eugene, sexual mm. Eugene. <laughs> right. Freudian slip yeah, there. Right. But... Um, you can go into the closet. You don't have to reveal yourself. You don't have mm -hmm. to be like upfront, and you know you may or may not be wearing your you know rainbow triangle or whatever. Yeah. You know, Whereas ethnic, ethnic diversity yeah. is on the skin, right? But you know, for me, the common standard is this: Do people beat you up or attack you for your difference? And if they in fact do, do you have a protection? B, um, are you entitled then to protection? And I'd say yes, on both counts. Would you agree with that? I would agree. Um, I've been accosted in the streets and struck violently by a homophobe on account of the fact that my umbrella was rainbow and therefore indicative of my sexual orientation. And, I mean... Attack for a rainbow umbrella? Yeah, you know... How ridiculous is this? In our fair downtown Eugene, our progressive city, out front of the Eugene Public Library in the afternoon... Whoa. On a weekday. Broad daylight. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And it was ironic because I had just given a speech at a PFLAG convention at the Hilton Hotel, oh, you know, okay. um, championing um, youth and uh, youth groups and how this is an important ability and to unify and keep people strong, you know, mm -hmm. because as an individual you can only do so much, really. But it was, it was ironic because here I was, you know, walking along in broad daylight, and this guy came up to me and he was like, wanted to start something. You could tell he was itching for a fight. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't too excited about the fighting idea, so I just stood my ground. And, you know, he was like, you know, you fag, if you ever look at me in a queer way, I'll kill you. And I was like, you know, I looked him straight in the eyes and I said, dude, if I were you, I'd take it as a compliment. And... <laughs> Fairly audacious moment. I'd say. Yeah. So what he did then was he shoved me, you know, and my brother over there was getting riled up. Yeah. Um, and he, of course, earlier that day was having a conversation with me about how he wished so hard he could do something to take that burden off my shoulders and carry it with me, you know, okay. the societal burden of being uh, discriminated brother, against straight. minority. Your yeah. bio brother? He, my bio brother, full brother. Yeah. Um, he's straight, but he's very supportive. Yeah. He was amongst the two people I came out to first, but mm. that's another story. Okay. Yeah. So here I was, you know, watching this battle, and the homophobe suddenly remembers that I'm the target, so he stops interacting with my <laughs> brother, spins over towards me. <laughs> yeah. Well, you could tell he was, he was utterly brilliant. I yeah. mean, to make such ridiculous judgments is to think that there was something wrong with me simply because I was gay. I mean, is indicative already of his yeah. alternate yeah. mental state. Yeah. So he spun around and struck me in the throat. Mm. And of course, for a while I had trouble breathing, and then right. for some while I had trouble speaking. Right. But the divine irony was, in his attempt to essentially emasculate me, he made my voice deeper and manlier than ever it had been before. <laughs> oh. <laughs> so I had the opportunity for the better part of a week to recount my experience in a gruff burlesque. Mm. Okay. <laughs> and it was ironic to say that the least. That is. You know. And it was, it was horrible and wrong that I was attacked and struck. And it was, of course, worse, the police response that I got afterwards. Mm. Uh, mm. I try to be gentle with administration because, I mean, they try. Effort really isn't enough a lot of the time. Right. And that shows. Right. 
but you know, here I was, I, um, I had been assaulted, you know, right. I had no physical interaction whatsoever except being struck. So I suppose you could argue that I ran up and slapped him with my throat on the knuckles, but that seems like a twisted argument. Right. <laughs> so right. I got the, ten the attention of the police officers, and you know, I was like, so you guys, this is the situation. I explained it to them as best I could, and I wanted them to do something on my behalf. They weren't excited about the idea. They thought I had done something to instigate. They thought that um, I had... Uh, initiated combat or something in such that it was a mutual thing rather than assault and that was ridiculous so I said well officer I don't really mind what you think I want you to go arrest him anyways because as a citizen that's my right and I'm pressing charges and I'm pressing so... charges so go arrest him well they tracked him down and found him and you know called me over and they were they searched him and realized he had concealed on his person a switchblade which okay was scary because okay. he was in battle with my brother right. and that could have uh, my brother could have died a hero for me that day and yeah. that wouldn't have done me any good so that was scary an illegal concealed weapon yes all right and that was all he was ever charged for that was all they not dared not the assault not the assault um illegal concealed weapon and he got in trouble because he had he was on probation from previous felonies or whatnot and why are we surprised at that yeah, well so the officers, I'm sure they're good people at heart, came over to me and proceeded to warn me and admonish me for being so audacious as to instigate a combat that could have ended in my death. They used his, Yo, wait his a minute. concealed weapon. You wait, wait a minute. You're at, it was raining, right? Or whatever. It doesn't matter. You had a rainbow umbrella. Mm -hmm. That's the instigation? That's the instigation. And apparently, the fact that he had a switchblade meant in the officers' minds that I should be more careful in the future, or I could get hurt. Hmm. That was vexing. When did this happen? This happened, oh, approximately three months ago, I would guess. Ah. You know, sometime. Okay. And it was, in a peculiar way, inspirational. Inspirational like... A thorn is inspirational to, to act on the pain, right? Mm -hmm. So I use that situation in order to understand further social climate in such that the administration itself, which generally is representative of social climate, would be shaped in such a way. Yes. So I took that to my struggle at South, of course, and got a lot of people more interested in what I had to say, more involved in um, advocacy towards sexual minority of all kinds, if it is a minority, which we can't be sure since right. it seems as if there's enough sexual minority that truth be told, the minority would be straight people. Um, and I took that and I formed a gay straight alliance and immediately we're quite successful. I mobilized, we, there became upwards of 50 members that came to every meeting and of course it was a d diversity of gay people, straight people and every other people that you can hope to imagine. and. We were quite active and still are quite active in creating social change. Mm. And as the after effect of the increased awareness at South towards sexual minority, um, I was able to present a speech at the MLK assembly okay. based on my personal experiences and what was going on. And it was, of course, a mandatory speech right. so that I was able to sit down with the entire school and tell everyone what I wanted to say. Hmm. It was a valuable opportunity. You know, I used it to the best of my ability. So it's interesting that they were thought they thought to include your speech as part of an MLK celebration. Oh, they didn't think anything of the sort. This is my thought, and I thought to include it. So I went to them, and I knocked on their door until they let me in. And originally, the MLK assembly was geared entirely towards African Americans and yeah. their struggle. I mean, well, because after all, it's a black. Uh, well, holiday, it's right? it's MLK's <laughs> thing, right? No, and, you know, it's about civil rights sure. and the American holiday. And that was my like, argument. Yeah, See, right. I okay. came into their meetings be, and I laid it out like this. I was like, "So you have to understand message of MLK," and I gave a little introduction about how it was totally about diversity and equality and how, although the Didn't African. Colbert Rustin. 
I, I used what arguments were necessary at the time. Okay. All right. You know? All right. And the fact that I su succeeded should attest. So. Okay. I. I More argued. Power to you. Well, hey, you know, it was Martin Luther King Day. He was hey. he was the name of power at that moment. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So I expanded the assembly. I got all the student unions to come. You know, I got the Asian student union involved. I got Latino student union involved, and I encouraged a friend of mine to found a Native American student union and get it involved as mm. well. Now we had a cultural diversity assembly mm. on MLK Day to celebrate okay. cultural diversity okay. and encourage civil equality. Mm -hmm. Now, Good. I also made space... And very much in the spirit. Well, yes. I also made space, of course, for the minority I represent, and that's not white people, it's the Gay-Straight Alliance. Yeah, right. And I got a space in the assembly, which I also had to fight for, in which I was able to present a speech. Now, it was interesting because the administration was very interested in what I had to say. And they really wanted... This is Randy and Company, yeah? Randy and Company and various other et cetera, you know. Okay, all right. They wanted me to write it out, um, so what I was going to say, what I was going to read, essentially, share it with them so that they could edit it and make it quote unquote PC. And I wasn't too <laughs> excited about that because that really would have taken a lot of the power of, out of what I had to say. Right. Um, now, did they actually use that language with you, PC? Yeah. Like, what did they think you were going to say? They thought I would offend people, and I did. Like. How? What did you say that was well, offensive? Well, I had a delicious conversation, I mean, delicious in a disgusting way, like too much ice cream, with um, the administration, uh, namely Steph Can, uh, about what it was that I could possibly say that would offend people. And her issue was that I r ran the risk of making the majority of students, which in her mind was the most important segment of students, uncomfortable. Now, that I would go up there and say something that would make them uncomfortable. How ridiculous. Well, okay. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm not exactly seeing her point, but let, let's look, let's look at the, the trigger incident yeah. here, okay? Because yeah. you're mainly talking about how somebody comes up to you mm -hmm. armed, yeah. okay? Assaults you. Could have assaulted you with the knife, according to the police, yeah. right? Because of the perception of you carrying a rainbow umbrella, right? Yeah. Now, you're not wearing, you weren't wearing any P flag, any GSA insignia, no. or anything else that would possibly identify you. Just a rainbow umbrella. Mm -hmm. I mean, you could have been like a walking ad for Skittles or something. I could have been anything. Anything, really. right? Yeah. So just because of the mere perception, somebody attacks you. Mm -hmm. Could have killed you. And you're basically talking about, okay, this is real, this is happening, this is appropriate. Exactly. So where's discomfort in that battle? Well, you know? Yeah, what's wrong with that? So where, where one minority suffers and risks, you know, death, if you will, we're still not doing anything for the sake of the comfortable mean. Right. That's ridiculous. Well, yeah. And I was, mean, the same thing. Yeah. So she would have had no problem with any, you know, Asian bashing... And, uh, I'll say because I'm part of it, nigger bashing, you know, red skin, you know, whatever. Yeah. None of that. Any one of those students could have talked about how they've been racially harassed at mm -hmm. South or in downtown Eugene or anything. Well, and I was free to talk about my harassment, but she stressed that I wasn't to be too confrontational because it may make um, the majority of students uncomfortable. This, this is... MLK Day, right? Yeah. And was he like reasonable or was he con nope. confront? Nope. Oh, oh, excuse me. Yeah. So, <laughs> okay. But it, okay, and <laughs> this this gave me a really strong atmospheric reading of her perspective. Yes. Right. Right. Sure. Now I used this and counteracted it and, as best as I could. And you, you know, this would be typical. Yeah. Really. Really, you, know, you could. This could have been any school, anywhere. Any administration in, in general, Pretty much. middle right. America, right. you know. Right. So I took the entire assembly. I went to each of its meetings, and I slowly converted everybody into a more confrontational mode. Into let's act, let's change, let's move this forward. Not let's talk about what was, and you know. So that's what happened. Mm. The entire assembly um, was geared toward 
discrimination towards what was going on in the world and in South and in our culture, in our society that needed changing. Right. And I didn't script my speech. I barely outlined my speech. Mm. And they passed on the outline? Well, <laughs> I pulled it off like this. I said, you know, uh, I don't really want to um, write out the whole thing. So, because it's not my style, I feel like I'd have to read it, and that's not very good public speaking, no, you isn't. know? And I was like, so how about I just outline it in detail? And I'll, I'll outline it in such a way, of course, that really I'll be the only one that understands what it means. Exactly. You know, because that's how outlines work. Right. And they were Clean like, well, well, okay, okay. As it were. Yeah. But you have to present it to us a few times before you proceed. So I was like, okay. Well, it's still going to be improvisational. Don't well, they yeah. understand that? But they didn't understand that. So what I did Brilliant is I... Brilliant tactic, by the yeah. way. No, it worked well. Yes. I improvised in front of them several times, speeches that were so similar that they couldn't differentiate, really. Mm -hmm. Then in front of the school, I improvised again, but this time passionately. Right. That's where I got my point across. Now, the repercussions of my speech are still resounding in that school. Uh, oh, wow. Everyone says it was one of the most sensational speeches at the MLK Assembly and at any MLK Assembly given simply because it was, of MLK Assemblies, the most confrontational and progressive one. Good. Yeah. Good. Well done. Yeah. So that was a small victory in a big battle. You know, a small pool of people, little South Eugene in a small city, and there's a little change going on, and that's positive. So I'm proud of what I can do. So um, what happens then when you increase your target quotient? Because, I mean, you've also done that now, too. Well, what happens then is you reach more people. Yeah. And when you reach more people, the people you reach have a choice. They can sit in their living rooms, or they can step out their door and live. They can act. They can create change. Now, when you present to any group, no matter how small, that's always the choice your audience faces. Either they act or they go back to where they were, to where they thought before. Now, the more people you reach, the more potential for those powerful movers and shakers, those few human beings imbued with the compassion to act, to act. The more people you reach, the more people have that choice. And that's a choice I respect. You know, it's interesting that, um, I don't know, I, I find this as, a, as an instructor, especially in addictions work, and basically talking about, okay, I don't, you know, your, whatever you learn in your religious institution, like, you know, just put it, you know, put it out there on Front Street, okay? Mm -hmm. Don't really care what your church says, okay? This is the science, <laughs> and this is why you react this way, okay? So, you know, just the awareness level of, you know, why we talk about sexual orientation rather than sexual preference. Orientation is an immutable characteristic. That's what you are. Yeah. Preference is a choice because no one would prefer to be something that basically the language and the culture universally reviles. Yeah. Right? And, you know, subject to attack from merely, you know, displaying what? Anything. Even, you know, whether, anything. You, yeah, anything, whether or not it's actually you or not. I've seen people ridiculed for their quote-unquote gay accent and not even... Gay accent? Gay accent. Okay. Uh, like that lisp or something that's, oh, right, that's right, culturally right, right. associated with homosexuality. The irony was they were straight. Yes. Yeah. 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 Um... So, I mean, that's part of the, controver the, the controversy that you're dealing with, and I guess people's uncomfortable mm -hmm. with that. Um, and a lot of it's miseducation, misinformation. Um, any number of factors, of course, contribute, but the main thing is ignorant has a, ignorance has a tendency to perpetuate itself because it's more comfortable. Mm. And I had the, that. Well, that needs to be more. Why is ignorance more comfortable? So, for example, like like the old idiom, "Ignorance is bliss." Well, now think about it. Why why would someone say that? Mm. Well, when you're ignorant, you don't have to deal with issues. You don't mm. have to face issues. You don't have to understand the pain of any situation. You can just be like, "Oh well, I don't know about it. What what I what I don't know doesn't hurt me," you know. 
Yeah. That's where Don't Ask, Don't Tell came from. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Uh, when were you first aware of your sexual... When did you first become aware of your sexual orientation? Well, I was slower in my awareness than the people around me were. Which um, people are you talking my about? My mother, namely. Okay. She knew um, that I was gay when I was probably one or two, you know, and all through my life. Okay. She could tell. How? I mean, she's telling you. Well, this, this she's is telling the me she this always. This is the family knew. narrative, yeah. right? Okay. Right. You know, she says it's something to do with the mother's intuition. Okay. But I say it's something to do with the fact that I would cross dress often and okay. convince my other brothers to do so. Okay. And there was always. A, you have sisters? Well, then I didn't, but now I have several. Okay. Yeah, I have. A complicated and well, dynamic well, right. family. Okay, so but, then you yeah. didn't, but all right. So yeah. you're seeing images of both genders, you know, and you know the gender representation, et cetera, et cetera. And, and even at a very young age, okay. something in me encouraged me to be more androgynous than okay. stereotypically straight acting, mm -hmm. which most right. young boys have a tendency to reach toward. Yeah. You know, the quote-unquote stereotypical heterosexuality, the, right. the machismo, the masculinity that we see right. in our culture, you know, right. guns and fights and whatnot. Mm. Even as a very young child, that repelled me. Mm. I would much rather sit in the daisy field and make daisy chains simply because it was more wholesome, more peaceful, um, and it wasn't in alignment with the stereotypical straight acting right. um, societal mold. Yeah. So that led her to have an intuitive understanding of my sexuality, you know? And of course, it was entirely untestable and, you know, judgments on actions, of course, are often erroneous, but as a mother, she made the right call. Okay, and so how did she so, nurture you then? She didn't do anything. She, she do let anything. it be okay. my thing, you know? Okay, all right. Um, Where are you in the birth order, if one may ask? Second. Second, okay. Yep. So she, it was your older brother that was with you at the library? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. She raised all of us, you know, the, the three boys of us that were there at the time, with an even hand, you know. Uh, we each were treated relatively equally, and our needs were all met well enough. So she did not encourage nor discourage what she suspected, and I'm grateful. Because had she done either or, I would worry that I'm not myself. I'm what she made me. Mm. Okay. You're um, your own man, I, as it were. There came a day um, at a swimming pool, actually. Uh, I was Amazon? I was 10, Amazon pool. Okay. And I was climbing up the ladder, you know, to a slide or something. And there were these teenage boys lounging around. And I had this peculiar moment where I was just awestruck with their beauty and it was totally inexplicable and it came from nowhere and I for a while had no understanding of what that meant or what it meant or Both what it, from you the know blue, as it were exactly yeah. so I just from then on had this sort of glowing appreciation for masculine beauty and as I developed further into puberty you know that of course became a sexual awareness mm -hmm. and at that moment I knew quite certainly that I was gay Mm. You know, never in my life have I been attracted to women as I've been attracted to men. Mm -hmm. Now, that's not to say I'm blind to human beauty. Mm -hmm. I know when a woman's beautiful, but I also know when a sunset is beautiful. You know, and I know when a flower is beautiful. Beauty is not sexual attraction. Yeah. So, I discovered at puberty, probably by 11, I was certain so that I was So, did you read gay. that somewhere, or did you intuit that? I intuited. Okay. Yeah. Everything I have, or most everything, is intuitive in some sense, in the root at least. And I asked that yeah. question basically to point out, you yeah. know, to to the viewing audience, okay, that we're not looking at social programming here, no. okay, that this no is social. inherent. It is coming from within the individual. It's really clear that when you look at the whole modality of you know looking at sexual orientation, that it is coming from within the person, and there's. You know, of course. you know, if we deal with, you know, the phenomenon of the intersex, it's like, okay, DNA code's putting this out. Four million birth, human births a year, that's just squarely in the category of intersex. So, yep. 
And All right, so you can appreciate yeah. beauty, sunsets, sunsets women, but men, I can also appreciate sexual attraction. Right. And at puberty, right. I started right. to. Right, of course. Right. As Naturally. you're promo genetically programmed to do. Of course. Yes. Um, I had never really thought it was um, a problem. I've never beat myself up about it. Um, in the situation I had grown up in, my understanding about sexuality was that if you want to talk about it, you can. If you don't, that's okay, too. You know, this is coming from home. This is coming from home. Okay. And that, that was my situation. And uh, in assessing the social climate, I made a choice to not talk about it. Okay. I spent five years not talking about it. And Why? I didn't want to deal with it. I wasn't ready to... Deal um, with the conflict. Basically. Deal with the conflict right. and deal with the identity. I mean, mm. for one thing, there's an enormous social identity right. that one is forced into when you're not strong enough to stand on your own two feet and be who you really are, you know? All right, Nathan, break that down for me because that's, I mean, that's a real important piece. It's we a deal big with, one. Yeah, okay. So to some degree, many identities are socially constructed, okay? And to not, some extent, all of them. Yes. 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 I will definitely concede that, right? Yes. And so that there's social pressure to conform to whatever blah, blah, blah yep. is. Right? Well, the journey of individual X. Yes. There reaches a point where he or she says to him or herself, I am this. And this, quote unquote, often is a socially stereotyped and accepted group that is categorized by characteristics which make it belong to that group. Now, in my struggle, I cannot, I could not at that time say, I am gay. Because socially, what gay means is speaking with a lisp, flapping your arms when you speak, you know, uh, <laughs> being obsessed with flowers and fashion and things that interior really, design yeah, interior and design and whatnot. <laughs> yeah. And they really are not at all central to who I am or what I think about. So in that way, I was very cautious about the danger of, in quote unquote, embracing my um, minority status to lose myself to it, you know. Yeah. And I saw a lot of people think that they were embracing who they were, but really they were embracing who they thought they should be. Mm. And there's mm -hmm. a difference, and it's the struggle of every Acting individual. Acting gay rather than being yeah. gay. Yeah, right. exactly. Whatever, whatever that is. Or yeah. essentially being gay so thoroughly that that's all you are mm. at the sacrifice of your individuality and your humanness. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was very aware of that danger and I spent five years. Through observation? How were you Through made observation. Aware? Um, it's natural to my character to be introverted. Okay. Uh, what I've always done through my entire life is have an incredible fascination with human interaction, you know, with emotional interplay, with communication. Um, my mother's told me that as a newborn baby, I would lie on my back fascinated for hours watching her talk with her friend, never complain, mm. and just enjoy that dialogue. Mm. And I've taken that with me through my entire life. Now, because of that, I have some advantages, some intuitive advantages about assessing social situ situations and understanding people. So I've used that to survive, basically. Because what everyone does in this madness of life is grab what tools they're born with and struggle to survive. And I've done so fairly well. So when in middle school, you know, I was aware of my sexual orientation and had seen the atmosphere and I had seen the social pressure and danger to belong to groups and therefore give up your individuality to have a quote unquote group individuality rather than an individual individuality, which makes more sense. I sidestepped that. I spent five years becoming who I was so thoroughly that I would be able to come out and maintain that. So you came out to your brother first? Well, I woke up one morning and I felt asphyxiated by the weight of something that was constraining me. Mm. And given five minutes introspection, I realized it was time to come out. You know, the chrysalis I had built around myself, I was outgrowing to the point where the wings I was forming and ready to spread were confined and uncomfortable. 
So hmm. I stepped outside with the phone in my hand, called up my mom, you know, barefoot and leaning against a tree, called my older brother over so he could stand and overhear the conversation. He didn't know what was going on, of course. And I did like this. I said, hi, mom. Um, you know I was gay, right? And she says, yeah, honey. <laughs> We've always known. <laughs> we've always, we've always. always known. Yeah. Who is the we? The familial we? The what? I'm not Who's sure exactly we? what she meant by that. Yeah. But I think she just meant her, like herself, her close friends, the people who were really close to me. Mm. And there was that, you yeah. know. And there I was standing barefoot in the grass, you know, leaning against a tree, you know, sobbing into the phone and coming out. And it was a really powerful experience. And my brother immediately, you know, came over and embraced me and was supportive, and um, it, it was really good. It was a good moment in my life. The next person I came out to was my best friend, Belle. Uh, I brought her up in a treetop, you know, because she asked me out. She's like, will you go out with me? And I really cared about her, and I didn't want her to struggle too much with rejection. So I brought her up in a tree, and I told Climbed her. a tree. Yeah. Okay. And I told her. So here's how it is, you know, and I broke it down, and I was like, I don't think we're right for each other. And specifically, I don't think I'm right for you, because I'm gay, and I can never enjoy a sexual relationship with you in the same way that you could enjoy one with me. Hmm. And I told her how I valued her tremendously as a friend. Were you being sexual then? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. But in high school, without physical sexuality, there's a lot of sexuality built on No, really? What was your first nonsense. clue? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Spend five minutes listening right. down any hall or classroom oh, and you'll yeah. see it everywhere. The air is right. thick with innuendo and innuendo, nonsense and, and gossip and, and pheromones and who knows what. Right. So to sidestep that whole issue and of course to be gentle with her, you know, I was like, I really value as a friend. Let's be really good friends, you know? And she was okay. She struggled for a little bit, and then, you know, we've had a well, really it wasn't strong friendship a ever of since. Her, personally, no, not being at all. And I was, I was being yeah. nice about it, you know. Yeah. And I made, I wanted to make it really clear I wasn't rejecting her. I was rejecting her gender. Yeah. Yeah. So she was okay. And the next person I came out to, or the next group of people, were my close friends, all of them. And. See, I'm not, I'm not one of the gay people that just like walks up to people and be like, hi, I'm Nathan, I'm gay, because I feel like that's not who I am. I'm a person who says, hi, I'm Nathan, I'm this, I'm that, I'm a billion things. I can't categorize myself. What I did in deciding to come out, I did it like this. I sat down and meditated on the fact that no longer would I edit or hinder or alter in any way what I wanted to say in regards to my sexuality. So... I'm in school, natural situation, people are making sexual jokes, I will too. But I'm going to make them openly, and they're going to be from my perspective. That was how I came out. Hmm. If there was a conversation in about... In school? In school, you know. In class? Or just whenever, in social settings? Whenever. Okay. Social settings. In class too. And bear you know, in mind, this is yeah. progressive South Eugene High School. It is indeed. Yeah. And you'd know since you were you're a loke essentially. Yeah. You known a lot of these kids since kindergarten. Mm -hmm. and Came out to my school. close friends, and most of them left me. You oh. know. Uh, they were het. Well, they were confused. They were confused. Okay. You know, I came out, and they were like, they had this moment in their evolution of friendship where they were like wondering if my interest in them was sexual or what was going on. Mm. And, of course, I'd never no thought of them in that like way No comments like, dude, that's so gay or whatever. Well, I'm careful with who I choose as friends. Yeah. And I choose people who are mature enough to not be so foolish as to use, you know, things of that nature. Right. Yeah. Right. So I came out to them, um, two friends, very close friends of mine, Nathan and Jacob are their names, and my friend Jacob was all right because he's a stronger human being than Nathan, but Nathan, he was so afraid that people would judge him for knowing me mm. that he would not even acknowledge me in the halls. I would walk by and smile or nod or anything. Ouch. He would keep walking. Yeah. I was okay. I could deal with that. I understood his perspective. I understood that he, he would suffer 
you know, for being my friend. Yeah. And every friend of mine Suffers does suffer isolation. a little bit mm. for being close with me mm. because there's the social stigma, you yeah. know. I have a lot of friends who are women, but I have just as many friends who are straight men. I have friends who are gay men. I have friends who are lesbians. I have friends with interesting, you know, I'm friends with interesting people. That's my criteria for friendship. I'm not, you know, friends with only um, women as a lot of gay people are because I'm uncomfortable with straight men. No, I'm friends with people, interesting people, okay. you know. And that was, that was my thing, you know. I had these interesting people I was friends with. I came out with them and suddenly they had the strange thing where they're like, you can't be friends with straight men, you know, because that has to be, like, weird. And I wasn't cool with that, so... I let them go off and have their weird thing, and then there came a time when I was able to bring them back and reinforce the situation and their understanding of friendship. So I've regained my friend Jacob, and my friend Nathan is still not strong enough to deal with being a close friend of mine. So he's not. He's an acquaintance at this point. What are your career aspirations, if one may ask? Well, now, many people have asked me that question. My answers have always been... Because if you like this at 17... How old are you? 18. 18. 18. If you like this at 18. <laughs> well, people have asked me that. And my common response is to sidestep the question in some way or other. Because I'm not really comfortable with a set future. You know? The way I've lived my life is to take up my past and hold it in the present so that I can see all that's coming in the moment and act how I feel is right at that moment. And to say, I want to be this, that, or the other thing doesn't work for me so much because it's projecting an imaginary series of events so far into the future that I don't know what will unfold between now and then in such a way that I may change my mind or myself along the way. All right, let me come at it from a different point of view, or a different place then. All okay? right, all right. So, granted, you know, our are positing that you're normal, you're a product of your environment, that, that environment at home, at least, was nurturing, uh, preparing you somewhat for a hostile world. If we're going to make certain aspects of that world less hostile, so one of the things I often refer to, especially in you know, my class, is about, okay, if we're going to reform education and make this intentional, like the plumbing lecture videos that presumably they still do in middle school. You know, they separate the boys and the girls and they show them the plumbing yeah. lecture. You remember that? Mm -hmm. That happened for you in middle school? Yeah. They don't tell me anything about gay sex. Right, they of course. They still don't in sex ed. Right. They so still don't in sex ed. It's still the heterosexual plumbing lecture. Mm -hmm. So, you know, unless you go, like, online to porn sites... Which I've never had an interest in. Okay. So, how would you redesign the educational system to do this? Or is that the place? It is the place. It is the place. Okay. If so. we can, ta if we can teach um, racial diversity and tolerance, if we can teach heterosexual sexuality, it's discriminatory to not teach alongside it alternate sexualities hmm. and it's really is it alternate or diverse well this is it depends. diverse to tv it depends. still right it depends right. Okay. Who, who shoes you're standing in so you know? oh yeah alternate you know? well wait a minute okay yeah. so i mean that's before we got i mean from the, the perspective of the mainstream which is what we're talking about because the mainstream sex education is straight oriented therefore yeah. any alternate would be anything other than ah okay yeah so, can I be provocative? Dare I be provocative? You can be as provocative I can. as you want. <laughs> <laughs> I look conservative next to him. I mean, <laughs> wow. Okay. So, for a long time, and it's still the case, yes. you know, but, you know, I, and I guess I, I can say this just noticing the trend. The same people who are basically today saying that marriage is between a man and a woman 50 years ago basically said marriage is between a white man and a white woman. Mm -hmm. And their objections to interracial marriage were based on the same version of the Bible. Actually, some of them even going so far as to say, oh, well, black people are cursed by God. That's why you need to separate the races because these people are cursed and, you know, 
That's why it's a sin and abomination to mix races, yada, 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 yada. I mean, there are people that are still saying that in the 21st century. Well, the biblical argument is interesting because um, the section that's most strongly against homosexuality is also the section that's very strongly against women wearing buttons. Yes. Yes. So you have to wonder, are people just picking and choosing what they want to argue about? I would say so, because people don't seem to argue much about buttons. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, is again, if, if we're looking at forms of discrimination, mm -hmm. okay, so unless you're willing to say that God really is racist, which is not or God sexist, worship, yeah. <laughs> or yeah. whatever, okay, well, if you all were wrong on that one, what else could you be wrong about? Well, and the Bible's been rewritten so many times through the eons that most of the rules are political statements. Yeah, well, but heterosexism isn't just, you know, relegated to Christians Not either. At all. Not at all. Okay? So, I mean, when we look at civil rights struggle and we look at, you know, I did cite Bayard Rustin and a number of other people, you know, in terms of looking at, all right, you know, at least look at the level that folks are being attacked for no reason at all, a mere suspicion of being whatever, right? And that they have a right to some protection and nurturance and you know acceptance in society if they're productive citizens yeah. and contributing citizens, right? So extending that argument then too, then looking at you know uh, curricular mentions and stuff like that, so we can say, okay, well, this is a foundation of our society in a free and democratic society, yeah. as it was before 1492 you know, to be blunt, and as it wa was in cer certain, you know, when I was talking about uh, 12 kinds of marriage, you know, among yeah. an African tribe and noted by a white anthropologist, well, okay, all of those aren't heterosexual, and that means that tradition is thousands of years old mm -hmm. and predates Christianity or predates at least the Western versions of Christianity. Yeah, Western, Western dogmatism. Right, so th there's a practical reason for doing that. And so, a, you know, when we look at the South African Constitution, which in fact does ban discrimination by sexual orientation, mm -hmm. Maybe we should take a page from that. Be a good idea. Definitely. So, um, let's see. W any final thoughts? Well, you asked me what I plan to do with my life. Yes. You know, what are some critical and emerging issues you see or want people to be aware of? Well, I can only really say in the relative perspective of my own life experiences and what's going to unfold in the course of my living. Um, the main issues um, that are emerging and have emerged and will emerge more are the issues of the hidden minority, yeah. how we are here but you don't see us, you know, issues of discrimination and stereotyping in general, issues of how even minorities defeat themselves by um, stereotyping themselves and belonging to the discriminatory minority. Mm. And as far as my life, I see it this way. I was born to a battle I never would have chosen. But because I am here, in this life, in this body, I will do everything in my power to make the next person not have to fight like I do. Whoa. Whoa. Okay. I'm only temporarily speechless. So part of that struggle, yeah. I'm not being flip here, but... As a sometimes martial artist, I look at that, having trained with, you know, um, teachers that were, you know, out lesbians, you yeah. know, gay instruction. What do you think about self-defense training as part of I have your fairly process? extensive self-defense training. Okay. And um, the only real advantage is, I mean, the confidence it gives you, the yeah. physical confidence. What I've noticed in social phenomena in general is people are only picked on if they can't deal with it. People are only abused if they can't deal with it generally. Mm. And the fact that I'm able to defend myself um, mentally, emotionally, physically means that I am less of a target than people who aren't. Mm. Now I'm still a target because the people that are so malicious that they feel the need to strike down everything I stand for, I'll face them and I'll face them in what ways they understand best. Some people can hear words. Some people don't have that ability. So. So, if you're going to produce someone like you, how would you do it? 
I would encourage them to produce themselves. <laughs> um, to produce who you are as a human being is the major struggle in life. Mm. To become who you are so thoroughly that you no longer doubt yourself or your capabilities, that is the battle. That's what we work toward. Not everyone's struggle is my struggle. Not, everyone who, not everyone's life has the purpose of unfolding in the way mine will. But in becoming who they are, in the way that they become who they are, they have inherent in their humanity the ability to do what it is that they have the power to do. Let's leave it there. So, thank you, Nathan Brackett. It's been a pleasure meeting you. This has been uh, Diversity TV. Uh, if you are so inclined, uh, please send feedback uh, to liveclass at lanecc.edu. Uh, this has been Diversity TV. And tell, us, uh, <clears throat> tell a friend about our program and tell us what you'd like to see in the future. Till then, stay strong. Mm -hmm.